The Peter Schiff Show. Well, the U.S. markets were off to a rough start. In fact, all the world markets uh, came out of the gates week on this first full trading week of the year. The Dow was down 331 points to finish just above 17,500. NASDAQ down 74 points. The catalyst, again, was weakness, particularly in Europe, as people are worried about a potential Greece exit from the Eurozone and the continuing decline in oil prices. Oil now down better than 260 on the day. We're trading just under $50 per barrel. Now, of course, most people are still talking about how great low oil prices are going to be for the U.S. economy. But again, not understanding why oil prices are coming down. Sure, uh, lower oil prices will be, you know, a, a consolation prize. It will be a benefit. But there are going to be many things that are going to be happening that will more than offset that benefit. Just the way falling oil prices in 2008 were a benefit. But it didn't stop the financial crisis and it didn't stop the Great Recession. But, you know, I'm hearing all this talk about, you know, how Europe is, you know, just a basket case and Europe is going to be decimated. I mean, listen to Jim Cramer on, on CNBC. The euro is going to go to parity with the dollar, really. Yeah, I just think that uh, money's going to be fleeing Europe all year. I mean, I think this European comeback story and being and treated by the believe, 11 multiples. And so QE begins soon. I think Draghi, structural reforms. The concerns about deflation. Real? Imagined? I think that it's going to be a lost decade for Europe. A lost decade? Yeah. And Japan, by the way, is terrible. Uh, China, uh, now we're starting to come to grips with those Macau numbers, which show me that China is much worse than expected. The United States is the only country on Earth that actually is going to have accelerating growth, which is really amazing. It is. About it. It is. Now, you know, the euro right now is just below 120 against the dollar. And on the news, they talk about, oh, this is a nine-year low in the dollar. You know, and you would assume if you heard that, that, well, the euro or a nine-year low in the euro, right, against the dollar. And you would assume, right, if you heard these reports of this nine-year low in the euro, that the euro has been falling against the dollar for nine years. No, it hasn't. It's been going sideways against the dollar for nine years. In fact, this is the sixth time in nine years where the euro has traded down to around 120. I mean, yes, we're slightly below, and we've been slightly below before in 2006 and in 2010. And sometimes we, we come to slightly above uh, 120. But we're in the area of euro support, right? This is where the euro has found support. And every single time, right, this is the sixth time. So the five prior times where the euro got down around 120, Everybody was like Jim Cramer saying the euro's going to parity. The euro's going to parity. And it never happened. Every time it got to this level, the euro rose. And I think it's more likely going to be a repeat of that situation where the euro again is going to find support, uh, particularly when I think the Fed is forced to launch QE4, which is going to do. Because if this is the beginning of a bear market in stocks, and again, I think we are going to be in a bear market without uh, the Fed doing QE4. So for me, technically speaking, I think the U.S. stock market is going to trend down until people believe that the rate hikes are off the table. Now, I think we're going to get a lot more negative economic data. Look, we got more negative economic data today. Nobody really talked about the auto sales numbers that came out for December, which were significantly below what the expectations were. They were looking for 13.8 million in sales. And now, you know, first I thought that they originally said that it was 13.3 million. Now I'm seeing 13.6. So I don't know which one it is at this point, because I, I originally looked at it, it said 13.3, and now it's at 13.6. But it's still below expectations, and it is a slowdown from November. And I would expect that slowdown to continue. In fact, if you look at Kramer in that clip I just referenced about the euro, he said the United States is the only country on earth that will be accelerating growth, right, in this year. We're going to have accelerating growth. How are we going to have accelerating growth when we're already decelerating? The high point of U.S. growth was the third quarter, right? So it's all downhill from here. So 
to see that we're going to be the only country with accelerating growth. We're not even going to have accelerating growth. There may be some other countries that do, but not us. We're going to be decelerating. In fact, we already are decelerating. The, the, the amount of spin, the propaganda that you get out there. I was reading this Bloomberg article today. The title of this article was Young Home Buyers Return in U.S. as Economy Accelerates. Young Home Buyers Return. Well, I read the article, and basically they interview a couple that decided to buy a house after waiting for a couple of years. So it's one couple. And based on that, the headline is uh, young home buyers return. No, they're not. This is just one couple. All the evidence shows that young home buyers are nowhere near returning to the home market. I mean, they're, they're, they don't even have a chance. I, the Wall Street Journal had an article over the weekend. I tweeted about this that said that people under 30, that have stakes in a private business, meaning, you know, they've started a business or they have some kind of ownership interest in a private business. This is 30 and under, right? It's now at a 24 year low. And everybody thinks, oh, the young people are just starting up these social media companies and they're all getting rich. 24 year low in entrepreneurship for 20, 30 year olds and under. Why is that? Because our young people are wasting all their time going to college, and by the time they graduate, they have so much debt that they can't afford to start a business. You need savings to start a business. You can't start a business when you're already in debt. So, you know, the fact to say that young people are now returning to the to the home market, now most of these young people are still living with their parents. The headline is very deceptive, as is always the case in Bloomberg, where they're trying to drum up this false sense of optimism, and they're still clinging to this optimistic growth scenario despite all the evidence that it's coming apart. Falling oil prices are a sign that the growth is not there. It's not something that we could just say, oh, this is great news. We're going to save money. Why are prices falling? And it's not because of all this production. We had that production in the last couple of years. You know, it's the demand side that is the problem, and it is the Fed talk about higher rates, which is not going to happen because if we've got falling stock prices, you know, real estate prices, soon we're going to start to see year over year declines in real estate prices. So we have falling stock prices, falling real estate prices, a decelerating economy. And I believe, you know, we're going to get the jobs numbers on Friday, but these un- weekly unemployment claims, they've been trending higher. Uh, we're now back at the same level we were about six months ago. I think the downtrend in new claims is over. I think we've begun a new upward trend. How is the Fed going to raise rates with accelerating uh, unemployment, decelerating growth, bear markets in stocks, bear markets in real estate? No. What are they going to do? There's only one thing that they can do, and that is launch QE4. And, you know, all this talk about how Greece leaving the euro so is 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 bad for the euro. How is that bad? I mean, the best thing that can happen to the euro is that Greece leaves. I mean, Greece has been a thorn in their side since the beginning. They cheated their way in. They should have been expelled from the beginning. Uh, but they're still there and now they're trying to dictate the terms. It's like you know, they 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 had a cheat to get in and now they're blackmailing the Europeans or by saying, hey, we're going to leave. You know, you never really invited us to the party. We crashed it. But now if you don't give us everything we want, we're going to leave. Well, let them leave. You know, and I hear these people on CNBC are saying, well, you know, if the Greeks leave, well, then everybody's going to want to leave. When they see, you know, the Greeks going and how great it is for them to have the drachma back, how great it is. You know, if Greece leaves the euro, they'll probably be the last country to leave because once people see how bad off the Greeks are with the drachma, nobody's going to want to sign up for that. It'll be the poster boy of failure. People think it's going to be the end of austerity if Greece leaves the Eurozone. Uh Uh-uh. It's going to be the beginning of real austerity because when all the Greeks are handed drachma, when Greek bank deposits turn into drachmas, when Greek government bonds turn into drachmas, when Greek workers are going to be paid in drachmas, Instead of euros, when Greek landlords are going to receive their rent checks in drachmas instead of euros, that's when the pain is really going to begin because the drachma is going to plunge. Interest rates are going to skyrocket, right? Consumer prices are going to skyrocket. It's going to be a real disaster for Greece, not for the rest of Europe. Now, the problem might be, what about the Spanish? What about the Italians? If if people start worrying about the, the Italian deposits turning into lira, 
or the Spanish deposits turning into pesetas. But what's going to have to happen is those governments are going to have to dig in their heels and say, no, 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 we're not going to leave. We're going to reform. See, that's the problem is nobody is actually doing reforms. But if people see how bad things are in Greece, because they go back to the drachma, well, then maybe everybody else will play ball. Maybe there'll be some reforms to avoid that catastrophe. You know, they're talking about how, yes, deflation is terrible. In fact, the German inflation numbers came out today, and year-over-year inflation, again, was lower than it was last month. It's still positive. Prices are still rising in Germany. But they're saying, oh, this is a danger because they're not rising fast enough. You know, as if the difference between prosperity and depression is a 1% rise in consumer prices. I mean, this is such sheer nonsense, right? Of course, Germany is not threatened by an absence of inflation. Neither is Greece. What's going to threaten Greece is going to be an abundance of inflation, because that's what they're going to get if they go back to the drachma, right? That's what they've got now in Russia. They've got a lot of inflation because the ruble is weak. But this whole idea that Europe is in trouble because they're flirting with deflation. I mean, again, the irony of it is you've got the same people who are telling us how great it is that oil prices are down. They're telling us how awful deflation is. Does anybody not see the logical inconsistency there? It's the same thing. If oil price going down is a tax cut, so is food prices. So are clothing prices. So are furniture prices. So are uh, medical costs. So are college tuitions. If, if one price going down is good, then all prices going down is that much better. Because instead of a small tax cut, we get a big tax cut. Yet people are trying to have their cake and eat it too in conjuring up this phony boogeyman of deflation. The one market, though, to really buck the downtrend was the gold market. Gold, again, off to a very strong start, up another 17 bucks or so uh, trading today. Gold prices rising significantly in all currencies, particularly uh, in the euro. But in terms of the dollar, we closed at 1205 But the real significant closers are in the Swiss franc and the euro. If you look at the euro price of gold, gold closed at 109 euros. That's a huge breakout. 1,000 euros, rather. 1,009 euros. Because 1,000 euros was a significant overhead resistance uh, in the price in the price of gold denominated in in euros and so now that we've crashed through this level this is the highest we've been in maybe about a year and a half in terms of the year you probably have to go back to um i'd say m- mid to late 2013 right before you saw the euro price of gold above a thousand so that's a significant breakout same thing in the swiss franc 1200 uh, francs per ounce was the key level. We closed at about 1,213 uh, Swiss francs for an ounce of gold. And again, the last time that happened was in mid-2013. And I don't think there's a lot of overhead resistance right now. And the key is, if we are basically starting new bull markets, the correction is over, the bear market is over in Europe for gold, right? So If you're in Switzerland or you're in Germany, gold is now in a new bull market or the or the bear market phase, the correction phase of this longstanding bull market. Right. That correction phase is clearly over. This is a brand new bull, another leg up. And the key is if you've got this new leg up, this new bull market in gold in terms of euros and and Swiss francs and probably other currencies, then how long is it going to be before the dollar joins the party? or, you know, uh, is asked to leave the party, however you want to look at it, and we have a new bull market in the dollar price of gold. I think that is coming. That's the one thing nobody is expecting this year. Again, I think 2015 could be a year of big surprises in all these markets. I think the dollar turns around and goes down, not up. I think gold has a spectacular year. And the U.S. stock market, I think, is going to be weak this year, even with QE4. Even with QE4, I think the stock market is going to be weak in the U.S. because that undercuts the theory of this robust recovery and earnings growth. I think QE4 will stop the hemorrhaging, stop the bleeding, which is one of the reasons that the Fed is going to launch it, to stop the U.S. stock market from going down. But I think that's about all they're going to accomplish. I don't think they're going to push the market to new highs, but I do think they can push the dollar to new lows. And I think that foreign markets 
will benefit dramatically from QE4 and from a flight out of the dollar, right? Kramer was saying that everybody's going to try to rush to get into the dollar. Uh, I think it's going to be the other way around. Money's not going to be fleeing Europe. It's going to be fleeing the United States. And if you're holding on to any hope that this new Republican Congress is going to be a game changer, right? That these guys are going to come in and cut government spending and reduce regulations. Think again. I was watching on ABC uh, this week and they had two uh, newly elected Republican senators who are going to be joining the Senate in uh, or this year. They also had a Republican congresswoman, but uh, she's uh, we don't have, she's not in this clip. Here's two senators, and they were asked the question: Will you vote to increase the debt ceiling? Now, when I ran for U.S. Senate, that was my main stopping point. Send me to Washington, and I will vote not to increase the debt ceiling. In fact, I will lead the filibuster against I- increasing the debt ceiling. But here we have two new Republicans joining the Republican majority in the U.S. Senate, and they're asked. Are you going to vote to increase the debt ceiling? And they both said yes. Will you support raising the debt ceiling when it comes up in spring or summer? I mean, obviously, uh, a country that functions needs to pay its bills, but we need to have a long-term conversation about actually dealing with all the structural insolvency in our entitlement program. The debt ceiling is less than a quarter of the real problem. The unfunded obligations in our entitlement programs are three and four times larger. So it sounds like you would vote for it. As a part of a down payment on a long-term reform, absolutely. Senator Jim. Well, that, I agree with Ben. We've got to focus on the other, the, the financial underpinnings that we have to take care of. The debt ceiling is just a part of that, as Ben said. So we would, but I think we're also trying to focus on something that's a credible strategy for retiring the debt and, and getting our budget, getting our finances back in order. Now, you know, they tried to, you know, mix it in with, well, you know, we want to combine it with this or combine it with that. But you know what? The bottom line is they're going to vote for more deficits. They're going to vote for more debt. They're going to vote for more government. They don't want to stop the spending. Now, one guy tried to say, well, you know, we we have to pay our bills. Yeah, that's the BS Democratic line. That's the excuse. Raising the debt ceiling is not about paying your bills. It's about not paying your bills. If you want to pay your bills, you don't raise the debt ceiling and you pay your bills, right? Raising the debt ceiling is about not paying your bills. It's about borrowing more money so you don't have to pay your bills. Now, of course, the reality is if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we can't pay all of our bills because we can't afford it. So we're going to have to cut a lot of spending. We can't make all the, we can't keep all of our promises, uh, if we don't raise the debt ceiling. But can we continue to make interest payments on the national debt if we want to prioritize that? Yes, we could. We just have to make cuts someplace else. But raising the debt ceiling has never been about paying your bills. It's about avoiding paying the bills, kicking the can further down the road. It means that the unpaid bills are just going to be stacked that much higher. But when you have Republicans saying this, I mean, what hope do we have of reigning in the deficit? None. Right? The deficit's going to skyrocket. There's going to be no pressure on spending cuts because the minute you know they say, "Look, you know we're going to, you know we're going to raise it." Well, that's it. You don't have any leverage, any bargaining power with the president. They know you're going to raise it. You know, so it's going to go up, which means we're going to have more spending and we're going to have more debt. I mean, if you are a Republican and you really say, "I want less government," then you have to say, "I'm not going to raise the debt ceiling," because a vote to raise the debt ceiling is a vote for more government. It's a vote for more deficits. There's no other way to slice it. There's no way you can sugarcoat it. Because if you don't want more government, then you vote not to raise the debt ceiling. Because if we can't raise the debt ceiling, in theory, we have to stop growing government. We have to stop borrowing. That's what all Republicans claim they want. But when push comes to shove, that's not what they want. They want what all politicians want is a bigger government pie so they can, you know, dole out more slices to to more uh, constituents or more uh, big pocket donors. That's all it's about. So again, nothing is going to change. You know, we're going to come and we have to do QE4. And again, when this economy decelerates, when, when we come into recession, which we could easily be in in 2014, because the oil bust is just the beginning of the problems the Fed's going to be dealing with if it doesn't have QE anymore. Because remember, right, QE was done. Why did they do QE? To prop up the asset prices, to prop up the stock market, to prop up the housing market, and of course, it also propped up the oil market. 
And it turns out that the oil market was the first market to cave without the Fed's support. But it's not going to be the last. The stock market's going to cave. The housing market's going to cave. All these phony jobs are going to go away. Right? The unemployment's going to come back. The recession's going to come back because none of the problems have been solved. They've just been covered up as they've been exacerbated. And that's what all these cheerleaders and all these talking heads, rah, rah, U.S., don't understand. This is all a fantasy. It's all a pipe dream. We're all, you know, strung out on the Fed's heroin, so we're true drugged out to realize how much of a mess we're in. But as we begin to awaken, as we as sobriety comes back and the effects of the drugs wear off, like it's happening in the oil market, and it's going to happen in the stock market and in the real estate market in a big, big way. These real estate prices without QE, and if we actually have higher interest rates, we're going to see a huge collapse in real estate prices, big time. And of course, none of this can happen. So all of this is going to have to be undone with another round of QE. That's it, right? And I think QE4 is going to be bigger than QE3, 2, and 1 combined if they can keep, if they can get away with it for that long without causing a, a complete run on the dollar. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies.